Well, good afternoon. I'm Monisha Bhatia. I'm one of the quality improvement chiefs over at the Miami VA. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today's Grand Rounds, Dr. Maria Carolina Delgado de Liebre. She's originally from Venezuela and is an assistant professor of medicine, founding director of the AHA certified University of Miami Comprehensive Hypertension Center as well. Dr. Delgado has several publications, book chapters, and peer-reviewed publications in the field of hypertension and cardiovascular disease with extensive experience in clinical, epidemiological, and bench research in the field of hypertension. She was the first to describe low intracellular potassium as an intermediate phenotype for essential hypertension and has been a lifelong research interest in understanding the clinical implications of biomarkers and the intermediate phenotypes in prevention, detection, and effective treatment of hypertensive patients. She was the recipient of the American Heart Association Samuel A. Levine Young Clinical Investigator Award, the AHA Women in Cardiology Award, the American Society of Hypertension Recognition Award for Young Investigator, and the National Institute of Health Institute of Health Biomarkers and Surrogate Endpoints Award, among many others. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Delgado. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, let's start. So today I want to talk about the reality of hypertension and the way we see hypertension currently in the hypertension center. So Basically, it's the four pillars of hypertension and how that can help us understand the role of hypertension in cardiovascular disease. So the most important is to understand the public health challenge that hypertension presents to the United States. Basically, half of the adult population, over 100 million people, are hypertensive. And the sad situation is that only one out of four are controlled, meaning that 75% of the patients that are known to be hypertensive are not controlled. So the, the, my, my most important message here is to understand that hypertension is critical, not only for you, the United States, but worldwide, and is the, the umbrella where our heart disease and strokes will eventually kill our population. So basically, if we talk about life cost, right, um, we have to also think about the monetary cost. So hypertension is about 131 billion to 198 billion each year. Is is costly both to the individuals, but also to the nation. And the expected cost by 2035 is about 220 billion a year. So we're talking about a lot. And sadly, hypertension doesn't seem to stop in terms of population, right? It grows with us. So what, what happened here at UHealth? So we have, for example, in the period from despite the pandemic, from December 18 to December 2020, we had a total annual adult outpatient population of uh, 500, over 500,000 patients okay, from the outpatient clinic that represent about 4 million encounters. From this population, there was a total of 30, almost 35 uh, patients that were coded for hypertension diagnosis, of which 58% had a blood pressure level of less than 120 over 80. So the concept, this is basically the most important message that I want to relay, is that hypertension is actually a complex systemic vascular disease, highly editable trait, is transmitted through the families with multiple cardiovascular risks that starts early in life and is the hub for heart disease or stroke. So two key things is that A is complex and B starts early in life. And C is not a number. And this is important because both for the physician and the patient and the community, the association of hypertension is to a number. If my number is low, 
or I'm taking medication and my blood pressure is controlled, then I'm not hypertensive. That's incorrect. Hypertension is a disease. It's a cardiovascular disease. It's endothelial disease. And uh, what we do with the number, and this is very, very important to see, this is the, the prior uh, blood pressure classification and the new ones. The number is a representation of the phenotype. So what we do is we create a threshold to classify the patient. And the most important here is when do we start telling our patients that their blood pressure is elevated or they're at risk? This is the big question because elevated blood pressure, as you can see there, 120 to the 129 range is basically young adults and even ch children. So we have to start looking at the young population. So the risk, as I mentioned before, if you left unchecked, hypertension can cause a structural and functional damage to the heart and vascular system. And over time, that can ultimately lead to dysfunction. Is the leading risk factor for heart disease, which is the leading cause of death in the United States. And is the leading risk factor for stroke, which is the third leading cause of death for women and the fifth leading cause for, cause for men. So this is important because even, and that's where hypertension needs so much education. Even in the patient's mind, they divorce hypertension from the event. Okay, I had a heart attack, but that has nothing to do with my blood pressure. Yes, it does. And that's where we need us as physicians and our patients to understand. So yes, hypertension is not only the most common disease, but also one of the most important motivational risk factors for coronary heart disease, a stroke, congestive heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and peripheral vascular disease. Hypertension basically is a threefold disease. It has direct structural damage just because of the flow mechanics, biochemical damage, which are molecules, proteins that cause damage at distance, such as endothelial dysfunction, and genetic damage. Because with hypertension, there is a lot or there's significant epigenetics happening. So this is to illustrate the importance of age and blood pressure level. This is an extraordinary study uh, published in 2002 in the Lancet. It's one of the most important studies of hypertension and vascular mortality. This is the Asia-specific relevance of usual blood pressure to vascular mortality, a meta-analysis of individual data for 1 million adults in 61 prospective studies published in 2002. This, it, it is a study about 1 million adults with no prior vascular disease recorded at baseline. In 61 prospective observational studies of blood pressure and mortality. As you can see in this figure, it shows the relationship of a stroke mortality to usual blood pressure is strong and direct at all ages with no good evidence of threshold at any age in the range of usual systolic blood pressure above 115 or usual diastolic blood pressure. So as you can see, there is any, it's, it's what, what I call longitudinal effect. It starts very, it starts with blood pressure that's not even at that time considered to be hypertensive level and it increases with age. That same study shows for the aggregate of vascular cause of death other than stroke or ischemic heart disease, both systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure are strongly and directly associated with mortality in each age range. As in the case for stroke and ischemic heart disease, there appears to be an approximately log linear relationship between usual blood pressure from these other vascular causes with no evidence of threshold down at least to 115 over 75. This is extraordinary data showing that the relationship between blood pressure, even at a level of 115 over 75, age and mortality. Now, these studies were done 
in adults, right? Association. So basically the association between high blood pressure and cardiovascular risk have long been recognized mostly middle age or adult population. But in this particular study, in the association between high blood pressure and long-term cardiovascular event in young adults, also a systemic review and meta-analysis, there were 17 observational cohorts consisting of about 4.5 million young adults that were studied. The average follow-up was 14.7 years. This figure shows that systolic blood pressure higher than 120, 129 was associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events, coronary heart disease and stroke in a dose responsive manner. Similarly, the association of the systolic blood pressure um, with risk of cardiovascular events, coronary heart disease and stroke more monotonically increased from a level of 80 from a level of 80 millimeter of mercury for the diastolic. So what we're seeing here is that even in young adult, there's a relationship of what is called the hypertensive disease. So hypertensive disease, again, not a number. The vascular damage just starts pretty early in life. All right. This is another very interesting um, paper uh, from The Lancet in 2016. And there is a arterial aging has a complex relationship with increased blood pressure and cardiovascular risk, acting both as a marker, outcome, and a driver. As shown in the life course, which is what you see here, um, there are three avoidable thresholds on which prevented efforts should be focused. So the development, this is where the childhood, early adulthood, the de development of elevated blood pressure, the development of what we call the subclinical target organ damage, and the development of overt cardiovascular disease leading to, phys to physical and cognitive disability, loss of autonomy, and loss of quality of life. The optimal or ideal life course is this green line, okay? represent individuals who only develop elevated blood pressure or subclinical cardiovascular damage, but, but to lead in the life course to substantially affect quality of life. This is a very important figure showing that basically not all hypertensive are the same and every detection and intervention are fundamental. This is important because as you can see in this figure, this this couple, they're in over 70, let's say 75, 80. They're both hypertensive. They have capacity. They still preserve their memory. They haven't had a stroke or a heart attack. So how can we explain that this young lady is already getting blood pressure treatment? This young man who is hypertensive had a heart attack. This young man on dialysis and this lady on her 50 has a stroke. So this tells us that hypertension as a disease doesn't behave the same way among hypertensive. And this is another um, very interesting figure from that same paper that shows that the main goal of, the, of preventing effort, right? is to shift an individual life course towards the ideal life course, right? So if you have early vascular damage or an average life course, you want to go as close as you can as you can to what we call ideal life course. Ideal life course go through your life kind of healthy or with quality of life, basically. So the the orange dashes line, this is, this is the orange dashes line, just show what can we do with prevention in order to move the curve to the ideal life course, which is the green one, okay? But this is very important here, this little square. This, look, it, it points out really early in life. So this is the effect that imprinting, which happens in the womb, and epigenetics happen. 
So from the em, internal, from the environment, from the maternal environment, already there is an effect that can bring this curve either to ideal or to what we call early vascular aging. And this is, this is so important because if you understand the maternal history and you can evaluate what was the degree of, you know, in uterus damage, for example, mother 23 years old, preeclampsia, we know already that there is significant imprinting. There's significant epigenetics in that baby. We know that this kid at 15 will have a systolic of 120 and 130. It's not because he's emotional, it's because that's the way he, his vasculature behave. So as you can see, part of what makes some hypertensive to develop target organ damage and cardiovascular disease is start pretty much in the wood as part of the maternal effect over fetus. In clinic, it's amazing because we see basically children 18 or older that already have left ventricular hypertrophy. We see young adults in their 30s that with a history of hypertension, they already have very high risk for coronary heart disease. So genetics, what happens here is very important in this outcome of life. So what do we do? I think the message is not everybody's the same. If nobody is the same, we need to kind of profile the hypertensive patient. Why you are different than the other? If you are A and this patient is B, this patient, I, with the profile, I can understand what is his closest risk for target organ damage or vascular disease or coronary heart disease. So uh, being able to establish a profile can help us, you know, not only establish an accurate diagnosis, in a targeted treatment, but also the prevention of cardiovascular events. So these four pillars are what we all know, genetics, biochemical, physiological, environmental. These are all four factors that are key determinants in establishing a hypertensive profile. So genetics. <laughs> Hello? Go ahead, Dr. Delgado. We can okay. hear you. All right. So in genetic, in the genetic pillar is basically sit down with your patient and trying to establish what is the family risk of developing hypertension. And basically in 99% of essential hypertensive, there will be a history of maternal, paternal, or grandparent hypertension, all right? So we need to know the familial transmission of essential hypertension. We, we need to know if that familial transmission of hypertension is tied up to a, other cardiovascular risk. So this is important because there's a concept called early hypertension expression. It usually are young adults in their 20s, 21 with hypertension. However, if you talk to their parents, their parents are not hypertensive. So they have the genetic pooling from their parents, but their parents are they're in their 40s or so they're not hypertensive yet. If you ask their grandparents, both are hypertensive. And usually these are kids where there is both paternal and maternal history of hypertension. The grandparents, but not necessarily are the parents are hypertensive themselves, okay? So when we have early hypertension expression, meaning that you're, the kid at 20 has hypertension, there is also a risk of early target organ damage. So these are kids that if you don't touch, you leave them unchecked, you leave them untreated, these kids at, 
after 10 years, when they're in their 30s, they're going to start showing left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic uh, dysfunction. Some of them will develop uh, ischemic heart disease, basically. And early hypertension, oh, I'm sorry, early hypertension expression is crucial when there is also a family history of coronary artery disease or a stroke. So a kid who is already in the 120, 130, 135 consistently, and he has family history of coronary artery disease or a stroke, including dyslipidemia, this patient is at a very high risk within the next 10 years to develop an acute event. So this early hypertension expression is related to this little box that I show in the other figure about maternal influence, epigenetics that happen early in life, but also happens later in life. So if it was that easy, since hypertension is a, has a family transmission, why can't we just find genes or a group of genes in the family tree? And that will answer mechanisms, and then we can do target genetic treater, treatment or diagnosis. Well, it's not that easy. And what happened with, with, with hypertension is that it's a very complex disease. And now we have a, um, a new domain or study that includes genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, protomics, and metabolic. And metamolabolic. So basically we obtain, we can obtain data that will make us understand not only genes as being coded, their expression, the protein production, and also the intermediate substance or molecules in the metabolic process. So these are studies that are ongoing right now. Okay, I'm gonna hurry up. This is just a description of proteomics and omics and how important if we profile hypertensive patient, how it's important to, to determine actually omics studies, okay? So the biochemical, and I know I have one minute, but really quick, the biochemical pillar is related actually to sodium and potassium homeostasis, kidney function and endothelium dysfunction. And basically by detecting biochemical markers, we can actually detect a culprit or intermediate phenotype that can drive blood pressure response to a particular class of antiperfantensive drug. The story behind sodium and potassium and aldosterone starts early in humanity or in life with the lung, with the lung fish and with the salt incorporation into the diet when population transition to nomad. So anyway, this is what we do. We do it right now. We do a spot sodium potassium in the urine, aldosterone plasma level, renin plasma level. Uh, we measure salt excretion or salt sensitivity phenotype. We measure potassium excretion or aldosterone cluster phenotype. And as of now, with the pathology department, we are uh, developing the assay for red blood cell potassium here for as a surrogate of intracellular potassium content. Physiological pillar, the word say it is blood pressure homeostasis, blood pressure variability. We do this with the ambulatory blood pressure monitor. And it's extraordinary because we measure also the circadian rhythm and how it's affected, okay, with blood pressure dysregulation. And finally, the environment. And the environment is actually a combination of genes and a combination of what is inside of your body and what the patient has around it. And this, the environmental pillar, right, really starts pretty early on in the wound and how the kid is raised at home. And then the other factors that the patient or the person introduces in their life. Basically, we might try to evaluate what are those familiar factors that the patient has that can affect blood pressure. All this, and really quick, I'm going to finish, is to establish 
a profile of the patient. The profile of the patient will allow us to determine a therapeutic profile. So what are the non-pharmacological interventions that will respond to the patient? What is the patient's blood pressure treatment related to their cardiovascular risk? Whether the patient is salt sensitivity and will respond to a salt sensitivity management, whether there's a potassium wasting profile that will help blood pressure uh, response to management of potassium wasting. Different when we're old and there's isolated systolic hypertension and obviously there's different with gender uh, specifically. When you do that, then you can establish cardiovascular risk. Hypertension, hyper cardiovascular risk related to target organ damage, for mobility, resistant hypertension, secondary hypertension, pregnancy, and cardiovascular risk related just to the family history. Uh, I, I truly don't want to uh, impose anymore, but um, thank you very much. This is what we're doing right now in the, in the uh, Comprehensive Hypertension Center. And the future is trying to incorporate these four pillars in homic studies when we do profile of groups, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Delgado, for that interesting presentation. We all greatly appreciate it. In the interest of time, I think we'll go to the next speaker. So I'm honored to also introduce our second speaker today, Dr. Corey Asher. Dr. Asher is an assistant professor of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at University of Miami. She has authored numerous papers in this field, including studies on the utility of respiratory thresholds and sleep studies and the management of insomnia and chronic lung disease. She's also dedicated her platform to advancing knowledge and awareness of pulmonary disease and sleep medicine to both the medical and general communities. She's been an, an ambassador for You OK Doc, an organization dedicated to helping physicians with mental health and emotional wellness. And she's the founder of Just Breathe Miami, a foundation for raising awareness of pulmonary disease such as pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Asher. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, of a left turn. This is gonna be a clinical vignette. Um, and most of you have probably seen me around somewhere. I'm always either in the ICU on pulmonary service or Right now, actively, I'm in the sleep clinic, um, but otherwise, so this is gonna be the case of a 70-year-old man with excessive movements during sleep. Okay, and as disclosure, I'm a faculty advisor and reviewer for Integrity CE that's sponsored by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, but that should not interfere with the topic that we are discussing today. So in summary, we have a 70-year-old man. He's just coming in for an annual physical doing pretty well. He exercises about 60 minutes per day. He's up to date on all of his age-related cancer screening, and he's having no complaints. He's just in for routine. His wife is also present for the visit because they always come together, and today is no exception. And as you're talking with them, she does mention, oh, there was this one time he was moving around in his sleep a lot, and he actually punched me in the face. And the husband says, oh, yes, yes, I, I was acting out my dream. I remember I was fighting a, a dragon, and I was trying to protect my wife. And then you probe, and you ask a couple more questions. And they're like, yeah, this has been happening a little bit, you know, regularly, but not on a daily basis that he's having really aggressive movements when he's sleeping. On physical exam, a lot of words, but essentially there's nothing um, uh, crazy leering out at you. He has a past medical history of using alcohol. He's been sober 10 years, high blood pressure that's very well controlled on lisinopril, and a history of a TIA with no residual deficits. His review of systems is negative with the exception of some mild fatigue. Sometimes he dozes off on the couch in the afternoon on the weekends. And his physical exam is unremarkable. So then you start thinking, well, what are these abnormal movements in his sleep? Is this a problem? Is this not a problem? What is my differential diagnosis? What am I going to tell my patients about this? And I purposely left this slide blank to make everyone sort of think in their head for a good 10 seconds. What would I do? What am I thinking of? So the differential diagnosis is 
a nocturnal seizure, most notably a frontal lobe seizure can cause these sort of uh, complex motor movements during sleep, a confusional arousal, untreated sleep disorder breathing, most notably obstructive sleep apnea, as long as other sleep disorder breathing um, problems as well, periodic limb movements, REM behavior disorder, and non-REM parasomnias, such as sleepwalking, sleep talking, and night terrors, which are different from nightmares. Ah, sorry, my presentation skills are not up to par, but today we're gonna to be discussing REM behavior disorder, which is in fact what this patient uh, turns out to have. So in regards to when you're seeing the patient in the, in the office and you're starting to even think about REM behavior disorder, what can you ask them that might help clue you into the different differentials that we just went over? You can ask them blatantly, have you ever acted out your dreams before? Has anyone ever noticed that you act out your dreams before? Have you ever injured yourself or injured someone else while sleeping? The timing of the event is also really valuable in regards to teasing out your differential diagnosis. Typically, if it's REM behavior disorder, it will last very quickly, maybe about 60 seconds or less. Something like a seizure could last a little bit longer, usually less than five minutes. And if we're thinking more of sleepwalking or sleep talking, that tends to be a much longer interval of time from about five to 10 minutes long. And then also a REM behavior disorder tends to present in the second half of the night. And that would make sense because if you think about sleep architecture and our normal sleep cycle, you tend to have more REM sleep in the second half of the night. So this is why you'll have this behavior more in the second half of the night versus something like a parasomnia or which is the sleepwalking and the sleep talking, you could see a little bit earlier in the, in the portion of the evening. And then after you do all your discussion, essentially what you have to do is a video polysomnography, which is an in-lab sleep study with the video on along with the EEGs and EMGs to look at muscle tone while the person is sleeping. And while we are looking for abnormal movements in sleep, a home sleep apnea test is not necessarily useful to look for REM behavior disorder. It could be useful in the sense of looking for untreated sleep disorder breathing, which was in our differential diagnosis. But specifically, if you're trying to evaluate for REM behavior disorder, it must be an in-lab sleep study. So we do an in-lab sleep study and I have three videos of examples of patients who are having abnormal movements. So here's the first gentleman. So he's moaning and punching. If you can see, he's punching the air. And he is completely asleep. If we look at the brain waves, we can see that he's asleep during that time period. Another example. So here he just punched the wall. And then he gets ready for it. So he's kicking. So in his dream, he's probably attempting to kick someone. And then he completely fell out of bed and almost hit his head on the side of that cabinet or dresser. And then this is a clip forward in the evening. He's back asleep again. And he's punching again.
and he's punching. So you can see if you're a bed partner with this patient, how you could somehow be injured or could be very hazardous to yourself as the patient. Most importantly, imagine you have a patient who is on full anticoagulation and this gentleman almost just hit his head on the corner of the nightstand here, that could be potentially fatal. So it very much can be a big deal. And then there's one more example, I believe. Yes. This one does have captions. What he says is somewhat groggy to me. It's difficult to make out, but he does have, there are captions that you can make out. <laughs> So that was just a really good representation of how vocalizations can be a presentation of, of REM behavior disorder. And then this is the last example of a patient that we have. This one's my personal favorite. Because you can see him actually running. It's so blatant that that's what he's doing. And that's it. And all of those movements completely asleep. Patient is completely asleep during all of those videos. So the diagnostic criteria for REM behavior disorder I'm not going to get into too much the nitty gritty of it, but just sort of a brief overview. I don't want you all to be little sleep medicine physicians walking around, but just to know um, what we have to look for. So all four of these criteria must be present in order for REM behavior disorder to be diagnosed. You need to have repeated episodes of vocalizations and or complex motor behavior witnessed. We need to have behaviors that are documented either by a sleep study during REM sleep or the clinical history has to be extremely suggestive that the patient is acting out their dreams to insinuate that it's happening during REM stage sleep. We need to have a sleep study that demonstrates something called REM without atonia. And it's interesting that this is the only parasomnia that requires you to have the only abnormal, um, abnormal behaviors that require you to have a polysomnography diagnostic finding. I said a bunch of words, basically you can diagnose sleepwalking without doing a sleep study. But in order to diagnose REM behavior disorder, you have to have certain findings on the, on the EMG waveforms to call it REM behavior disorder. And then last but not least, of course, you need to rule out all other causes that could be likely causing it. So it's a diagnosis almost of exclusion to make sure that there's no secondary causes. As I was uh, here. Very busy slide. Again, I'm not trying to make you guys all into sleep sleep um, physicians. So on the left, we have what in the world is REM without atonia on that one diagnostic criteria that was necessary in order to make the diagnosis. Over on the right side of the screen, we have, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the top um, from here to here, the top, um, the top box is a normal sleep study. And then at the bottom, the bottom starting with the second red box, this is um, REM without atonia. And so basically there's two different stages of REM sleep. There's phasic and tonic. And phasic is when you have your rapid eye movements, which you can see in the red box on each. So on top is the normal, on bottom is the REM without atonia. So that's how we know that we're having rapid eye movements and that we're in REM stage sleep amongst some other waveform criteria that we see. In phasic sleep, you're supposed to have transient muscle activity. That's totally normal. Imagine your pet who's sleeping and they start going like this. Oh, you guys can't see me. When um, the muscles start twitching, that's normal. However, based on this definition, when you have it sustained for long periods of time between 0.1 to 5 seconds, that's considered not normal. And in co contrast to the tonic stage of, of REM sleep, which is when you have atonia, complete paralysis of your voluntary muscles, it's intentional that your body does for you. And you can see that in the green box is the leg EMG on the top. See how it doesn't 
it's pretty consistent, it's plateaued. And then in the bottom green box, you see all this movement, all this stuff. That's abnormal to be present during REM sleep. And to give you an, um, a reference, so for the tonic definition, they're saying that if you have at least twice your background muscle tone or more than 10 microvolts, then that's being considered something that you can count as abnormal muscle tone. For example, a periodic limb movement requires you to have um, eight microvolts over your baseline. So this is not a little tiny movement that you can barely see that makes the criteria. It's a big movement that you're going to be able to visualize. Very briefly, um, REM behavior disorder, how in the world does it happen? It's a totally normal phenomenon. So essentially, we don't know exactly how every neuron fires in the complex workings of the brain, but we do know that it's normal and it's somehow associated with the subcaruleus complex in the rostral pons. So essentially you have inhibition of your, of your muscles coming from the spinal cord. And in REM behavior disorder, you lack that inhibition. So therefore your muscles are not paralyzed and you do act out your dreams. The idea or the theory behind atonia during REM sleep is it's supposed to be protective so that you don't injure yourself. You don't injure someone else. You are not out acting out your dreams, um, which can be a gigantic safety issue. And as a side note that might come up in a couple slides. So narcolepsy is a problem with REM sleep that you can't, the gatekeeper to REM sleep is out to lunch. So essentially you'll go from awake to REM sleep and, and back and forth, almost like a, like a light switch. So that's how sometimes REM behavior disorder might be associated with narcolepsy. So the epidemiology, who are the people that are gonna have this? 80% male predominance. Less common in women doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in women. Um, it usually presents in the sixth to seventh decade of life if it's primary and sporadic REM behavior disorder. Um, the general population for the prevalence, it's a little difficult because we do think that it's grossly underestimated because patients are undiagnosed. But on average, about 0.5 to 1.5% of the general population. Um, if you do have someone who doesn't fit this typical presentation, uh, male in his 70s, um, and you have a patient who's less than 40, or you have a woman, um, the other things that can cause secondary REM behavior disorder is medication side effect is one, two, three, four, and five number, number of what has to pop into your head when you hear REM behavior disorder. Pretty much all of the classes of antidepressants with the exception of bupropion can cause REM behavior disorder. Also alcohol withdrawal, I'm sure other substance abuse that I am not particularly, um, that I can't specify, but alcohol for sure. Narcolepsy, as we just talked about, as it has the switching of the, narc of the oh, sorry. It has the uh, switching of REM sleep going on and off. In younger patients, looking at a brainstem tumor, because if you think about it, where does all of this come from? It's initiated from the brain that's sending out the inhibition to the skeletal muscles. So a brainstem tumor could be in your diagnosis. And especially in women, autoimmune disease can sometimes present with REM behavior disorder as well. Sorry. Okay, so clinical considerations. Now that we have REM behavior disorder, what in the world are we going to do with it? What's the goals of our treatment? Goal number one in regards to specifically REM behavior disorder is safety. Patient safety, the safety of those around them, any bed partners. Um, over 50% of patients who have REM behavior disorder will report some sort of injury of themselves or to a bed partner. That can range from anything of a black and blue mark to a fractured skull to a black eye to as we were um, considering for the other gentleman in the video to a brain bleed. Um, and we really have to make sure in regards to our goals of treatment that we do our due diligence with proper risk assessment 
for alpha um, synuclein neurodegenerative disorders because there is a strong correlation of having REM behavior disorder and the possibility of developing one of these neurodegenerative disorders later on in life. So it can be considered a prodromal um, diagnosis, meaning it can be the red herring saying, oh, there might be some neurodegenerative disorder coming later. And the alpha synuclein disorders associated with REM behavior disorder are Parkinson's disease, dementia with um, Lewy bodies, and multiple system atrophy. And it's been a little while since I took my boards, but I'm pretty certain that that's a very common question to be on the internal medicine board exam. Um, the exact correlation is not completely known. Uh, when I was looking through the literature, it says up to 50% of patients with sporadic REM behavior disorder, again, not secondary, not caused by another uh, differential diagnosis that we went through. Um, so up to 50%, I read some other papers that um, said that patients up to about 90% of patients will develop multiple system atrophy. Um, and in 2019, the, the data that's frequently quoted is from Dr. Postula, which is that there's a 6% annual rate of a new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease in anyone with primary REM behavior disorder. And that by 12 years, there is an incidence of 75%. Um, so what can you do with this information? What are you gonna do? You can, if you're seeing your patient in a primary care office, this might probe you to start asking more questions about early signs of Parkinson's disease. Are you having dementia? Are you having any changes of your smell? Are you having any difficulty with your motor function? Any difficulty with cognition and with, and with motor skills? And there's also a correlation of REM behavior disorder being associated with the more aggressive forms of Parkinson's disease rather than a milder form. So this is certainly why you would wanna keep your antlers, if you will, your antlers up and looking for signs of Parkinson's disease or the alpha synuclein neurodegenerative disorders as well. So the treatment for REM behavior disorder. So essentially the two, the two, um, the bidirectional arrow, those are two things that we're going to do simultaneously. First, we're going to assess for secondary REM, uh, REM behavior disorder. Any antidepressants, you really need to, you know, discuss if they're able to come off of those medications, maybe consider switching to bupropion, um, and then also look for any untreated ob obstructive sleep apnea, as we mentioned, treat it and then reassess any circadian rhythm disorders, because if you have sleep fragmentation, that can also cause you to have abnormal um, movements in your sleep and REM behavior disorder. So essentially anything that could be causing it, you need to think about, treat, and then reevaluate after you have adequate control of, of whatever diagnosis you have. The next step is that you, safety, 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 safety of the patient, safety of the bed partner, because this can be really dangerous. Things that we sometimes recommend or I sometimes recommend to my patients, you can have bed safety rails, you can put your mattress on the floor so that you don't accidentally fall out. You can sleep in a sleeping bag, lock up any firearms, make sure that there's nothing, no tables around with sharp edges. Um, that's really important to make sure that you prophylactically prevent your patient from having a possibly catastrophic injury during their sleep. If you do both of those things and you still have REM behavior disorder that's just out of control and you need treatment, first line treatment is clonazepam. It is the only medication that is FDA approved to treat REM behavior disorder. However, that being said, this is the world of medicine. So the actually the most often prescribed medication to treat REM behavior disorder is melatonin, um, but it is not, it's used off label. It is not FDA approved. Both of the mechanisms of action on how this actually treats REM behavior disorder is, is not completely known to detail. Um, for the clonazepam, there is a suppression of REM sleep. You have a decrease of your REM sleep, so you would have less REM um, behavior disorder, and you also have the myelorelaxant property of the clonazepam. Um, the melatonin, it's important to mention that this needs to be high doses of melatonin. Um, so this is the one time that sleep physicians might actually prescribe melatonin long term, and it would be like six to 12 milligrams of, of melatonin, which is a very high dose. So when I have someone come in for insomnia and they tell me that they're taking over the counter melatonin of 20 milligrams, 
my jaw hits the floor. Um, other medications that are being experimented on, off-labeled, not necessarily very, um, very abundant when treating REM behavior disorder are listed below. And so the major takeaway points is, if you think REM behavior disorder, please, please, please look for secondary causes because we can't call it primary REM behavior disorder without ruling other things out first. And there's a lot of secondary causes that could be, that could be creating the symptoms for the patient. You need to have a video polysomnography for a diagnosis. You, um, pharmacological management is not always necessary. So that's when we were doing the, the safety hazard, the safety precautions for the patient. If the, if the REM behavior disorder is not causing them harm, it's not causing harm to someone else, it's best to try and treat it conservatively. It doesn't necessarily warrant that you need to give them medication for it. Quality of life is a major aspect in regards to deciding with your patient whether or not um, pharmacological management is indicated or warranted. And then for patient counseling, we, we really have to be extremely cautious when we talk to our patients because at least for me, when I was in training, it was sort of drilled in, into me in med school, I believe really early on, REM behavior disorder, Parkinson's disease, REM behavior disorder, Parkinson's disease. And sometimes we do a little bit more harm than good if we, you know, if we ring the alarm prematurely and we can, some, we can cause the, the, um, the patient to have unnecessary anxiety, unnecessary prolonged medication, and unnecessary diagnosis. So just really be aware of what you're saying to the patient because it has very long-term consequences in their mind. And then as always, sleep referral is always a great option. So anything that you need, we're here. I put my, pers my, my email address on the bottom along with the sleep center phone number if anyone should need us for anything. Thank you, Dr. Osher. That was a, a really beautiful presentation and certainly something that I don't think about on a daily basis. My wife might, but I, I certainly don't think about it. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed both these presentations. We do have a few minutes left over. If anybody from the audience has any questions uh, for either Dr. Delgado or Dr. Osher, please unmute yourself. Do we know if clonazepam decreases the development of Parkinson's disease or other alpha synuclein related disorders? As of right now, no. So there's no indication that even identification of REM behavior disorder or early treatment of REM behavior disorder is going to limit, one, the diagnosis of, of Parkinson's or two, the rate of progression of Parkinson's. All we can say is that it's a sign that we should really be on the lookout for it. Thanks. Corey, this is uh, this is Norish on the uh, um, converge side here. What about the use of chronic tricyclics or antidepressants? We've got a large population in the internal medicine world that gets prescribed these things. Are these medications risk factors for developing our REM behavior disorder? What's the literature on risk? What an interesting question you ask, because I had the very same question yesterday. Um, I don't, there, I don't believe that there is any long-term research in regards to the chances of using antidepressants and the development of Parkinson's disease, but it certainly is something that I was thinking about. Yeah, you Thank know, you. I think, I think this oh, is- go ahead on. No, I'm so, so sorry. I think this is an important area because these drugs are commonly used. Uh, I, I can imagine every patient that you see will be on some antidepressant or at least a high proportion thereof. And I think it's important from the standpoint of understanding, and we actually will have the data and many of the data sets at U of M to think about this. So thank you for a great talk. Again, thank both our speakers for very nice uh, presentations. Please go to the chat in order to uh, uh, claim MOC and uh, CME credit. And I'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Have a safe and pleasant day.